What's growing on, gardeners? It's Monday, October 2nd, and it is a beautiful fall evening here on the southeastern coast of North Carolina. On today's video, I'm going to share with you a complete guide on growing everyone's favorite family of spring and fall vegetables. I'm talking brassicas. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell to receive new video notifications and check out our Amazon store and Spreadshop links in the video description for everything I use in my garden and awesome custom designed apparel and other gear. Your support is greatly appreciated. The brassica family of vegetables makes up a wide variety of what we commonly find in grocery stores and in vegetable gardens. Some examples of common plants in the brassica family are arugula, also known as rocket, bok choy and pak choy, broccoli, broccoli rob, also known as rapini, cabbage, cauliflower, collard greens, kale, kohlrabi, mustard greens, radishes, rutabaga, turnip, watercress. That's probably some of the most common things that you will find, but the list is even longer if you look at the entire family of vegetables. Brassicas love growing in the cooler weather found in spring and fall. They are frost tolerant. They have a low requirement for fertilizing when compared to heavier fruiting vegetables commonly grown in the summer, and they generally speaking are low maintenance and require little to no pruning. For these reasons, they are great for new gardeners looking to learn how to grow their first vegetables. I'm going to break this video up into a series of tips that will help you grow brassicas more effectively. And the first tip that I'm going to give you is to succession plant your brassicas. Now, what does that mean? Succession planting is simply the act of planting out a crop over a period of time. So let's say I want to plant 24 broccoli plants and I want to harvest 24 crowns of broccoli. Well, if I plant all of those plants at the exact same time, what am I going to do when all of my broccoli comes to maturity at the exact same time? I'll go from a massive amount of broccoli to none. So a better plan may be to take those 24 plants and plant six at a time over the course of four weeks. That way I can extend my broccoli harvest to a manageable period of time and harvest the fruits of my labor over the course of a month. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This raised bed garden that you see right here is my first crop of brassicas for the fall. And what you see right here are plants that are in all different stages of growth. So right here, you see a couple of broccoli that I transplanted, that I started from seed indoors back in the summer. These are several weeks old. Now at the same time that I transplanted these plants directly into the garden, I sowed some new broccoli seeds all along here. So these plants, believe it or not, are a solid three or four weeks behind these plants. That means I will have a manageable harvest that I can stagger over the course of late fall instead of having more broccoli than I know what to do with all at the same time. I followed the exact same system with my cabbage. Here I have some purple cabbage that is growing along and is several weeks old. And then over here you can also see that I just recently sowed some new cabbage seedlings and they are just beginning to break ground. So those cabbage seedlings are going to be three to four weeks behind the larger transplants that you see over here. And that is the same theme that I'm going to follow. In fact, later in the video I'm going to show you how to sow the seeds directly. So I'll have a third crop behind them. The second tip is proper variety selection. Now when it comes down to it, you have to know and understand your climate because where you live has dramatic variations on what temperature fluctuations and the length of your growing season, the length of each individual season may be. For example, if you live in a place like Texas, you may have very short springs and very short falls. If you live in a place like the Pacific Northwest, your spring and your fall weather could seemingly drag out and last practically forever. So you need to choose proper varieties that deal with heat and cold in such a way that suits your climate. Let me give you an example. When growing brassicas and frost tolerant vegetables in general, you will find that there are certain varieties that are known for extra cold tolerance and other varieties that are known for extra bolt resistance. Now cold tolerance is self-explanatory, but bolt resistance is the propensity for a crop to go to seed when it starts getting really warm out. So here in North Carolina, where our spring can turn into summer very quickly, it's generally advisable for a spring planting to plant bolt resistant varieties that can handle the excess heat without going to seed. In the fall, on the other hand, where your crops are more likely to mature in cooler weather, it is better to often plant more cold tolerant varieties of brassicas and other cold hardy greens and such because plants that are geared for the colder temperatures tend to be less bolt resistant, but you don't need the bolt resistance if they're going to mature in the really cool weather. Another thing you have to do once again is know your climate and how long 
long your shoulder seasons typically last. For example, I have two different varieties of broccoli right here. We have this DiCicco var variety of broccoli, which makes small heads of broccoli, and they have a days to maturity only in about 48 days, so they're a very fast to maturity plant. But something like this Waldham broccoli, uh, that has a days to maturity of more like 60 to 90 days. So you really need to understand what the length of your shoulder seasons are when you make the variety selections, because if you tend to have short falls or short springs, you may want to go with the faster to maturity varieties. But if you have really lengthy, nice, cool seasons that last for months on end, you may want the longer days to maturity varieties because they can stand longer in your garden in the winter. And also they tend to have larger heads of cabbage, larger heads of broccoli, etc., etc. So you will get overall a nicer crop if you have the growing season that has the luxury of being stable long enough to grow the longer days to maturity varieties. Now, when it comes to growing brassicas, should I start them as transplants or should I direct sow them as seeds into my soil? Well, what you do is going to depend on the situation, the time of year, and your unique climate. So tip number three is going to be when you should start transplants for your brassica seedlings. Here where I live on the southeastern coast of North Carolina, I like getting my first spring crop of brassicas out into my garden in early February after the worst of the January cold has passed. And I like getting my first crop of fall brassicas out into my garden in September after the worst of the summer heat has passed. The problem is I can't direct sow them in January in my garden because it's too cold out for proper germination and they'll grow too slowly. And I can't direct sow them in August in my garden because the soil here is so hot the seeds won't germinate. So in those instances when the environmental conditions outside do not align with your ability to start a plant from seed, simply start them indoors. Then you can give them a big head start and then you can plant them outside in your garden when they're four to six week old transplants and that is what gives you a big jump start on both seasons. Now this is where you must understand your unique climate and situation. If you live in the Pacific Northwest or in a lot of areas of New England or the upper Midwest or maybe coastal areas of the West Coast, you may be able to grow brassicas almost all year long or at the very least from April or March all throughout the summer and into November and December. So if that is the case, you may be able to germinate the seeds in soil and you may never have to deal with transplants. Conversely, if you live in a place with really Really hot weather, like let's say you live in Houston or San Antonio or Phoenix or Vegas, your soil temperatures may never get cool enough long enough for you to actually direct sow them. If it actually does get cool enough in December or January, by the time you actually sow the seeds in ground, it may get so hot so quickly that they'll bolt on you. So if you live in an environment like that, you may need to always start them indoors. That way they will be decently developed plants so they can go in when the weather just starts cooling down. So you really need to think about where you're at and adapt. It may take you a few seasons to nail the timing. Tip number four is going to be when you should sow your brassicas directly in ground as seeds in your garden beds. And that's going to be when your soil temperatures have cooled off considerably, but you still have enough of a cool season left that you can mature your brassicas before the really severe freezes that can damage the plants start rolling in. Now that's probably going to be when your soil temperatures cool off at least into the 70s, because if your soil temperatures aren't 70 degrees or cooler, you're going to struggle to germinate brassicas. So for me, uh, I like direct sowing sometime in September because our nights cool off sufficiently enough. We finally get nights in the 60s where the brassicas will germinate directly in ground. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have weather where you can choose between either transplants or direct sowing, I generally prefer direct sowing and here is why. Transplants are more maintenance because you start them in seed trays and they are more likely to dry out on you. They're also more likely to damp off from fungal disease. Also, also, when you transplant those new transplants into the garden, they tend to need constant maintenance in terms of watering. They can wither away on you very quickly, whereas seeds that germinate directly in ground have much better tolerance to drought. I find that when I plant things from transplant, I have to constantly water them every single day for at least two weeks in order to stop them from drying out and wilting, but I don't have to do nearly that amount of work when they are direct sown. So if you have the luxury of doing both, I generally speaking, prefer direct sowing. 
But again, know your climate. If you're going to direct sow, you have to make sure that you have enough growing season left in order for those plants to reach maturity. If you direct sow too late in the, in the late winter and it gets too hot too quickly, you'll lose your crop. If you direct sow them too late in the late summer or early fall and it gets too cold too quickly, you will lose your crop. So you have a lot more of a time buffer when you start those transplants indoors since you're starting out with a much bigger plant that will reach maturity more more quickly. So make sure that your climate can handle direct sowing of seedlings. Now I'm going to show you how to plant brassicas. Now whether you decide to sow your seeds directly in ground or in seed start trays, we are going to follow the same procedure because each individual planting hole or each individual cell will need two to three seeds. And that's because we have to assume that all of the seeds are not going to germinate. We can't just put one because nothing may come up. So we want to make sure that we overseed each individual cell or planting hole in our garden bed. In my raised bed garden, I will be spacing each of my rows one foot. That is generally speaking enough for pretty much any brassica. But how closely you space each individual plant is going to depend on the species that you're growing. Here I'm going to grow broccoli and mustard greens. I'm going to space the broccoli plants about eight inches apart. I'm going to space the mustard greens about six inches apart. If I was going to grow something with a wide girth, like a big head of cabbage, I may space them 12 inches apart. So always consult the seed spacing on the back of the package, or just use your experience as you gain more and garden more. So right here I have a little nifty tool. It's a furring strip that I marked off six inch lines on, and this makes it really easy for me to figure out where I'm going to plant all of my individual plants. So the mustard greens are going to go at each dash mark and I'm going to scrape away a section that is about a quarter inch deep. That's all you have to cover these seeds, only about a quarter inch, maybe half an inch tops. If you bury them too deeply, they will not germinate, but if you don't bury them deeply enough and you get a hard rain, the soil can wash away. So that quarter inch to half inch Seed depth is usually perfect. So this is where my mustard greens are going to go. Now I'm going to put eight inch spacing for my broccoli. So I should be able to get five broccoli plants here and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mustard green plants here. So again, I'm going to sprinkle about three seeds in each hole, maybe closer to four. And if they all germinate, we'll just have to thin them off. Once the individual plants reach about uh, about three or four inches tall, we can cut off the weakest ones and give the bigger ones um, more room to grow. But something that's a leafy green, like a mustard green, you may even be able to let all of the individual seeds grow and just harvest them with smaller leaves. So they're all planted. We're going to lightly cover them back up and pat them down. And now we're going to put about three broccoli seeds in each individual hole. And then once the seeds are planted and your soil is tamped down, we're just going to water them in. And my fifth and final tip is going to center around cold protection and insect protection methods. Let's start with cold protection. Now, how cold hardy your brassicas are is going to depend on the species and the variety of the brassicas. For example, something like this dwarf blue curly kale here tends not to take damage until the mid to low teens Fahrenheit and doesn't really get killed until approaching the single digits. Something like this lacinato kale may take damage in the upper teens. It's not quite as cold hardy. However, generally speaking, kale is by far one of the most cold hardy of all of the brassicas. I have found that cabbage for the most part starts taking some type of damage in the mid 20s. Broccoli and cauliflower, they're a little bit different because the young plants that are well established tend to be very cold hardy. However, when they start getting the big crowns on them, the crowns on the other hand are very susceptible to burn from frost and freeze. But no matter what you're growing, this is what I recommend. I've found two things are true when it comes to brassicas. First off, they tend to be more cold sensitive when the first few frost and freezes of the year come in and then they acclimate and they get hardened off and they can tolerate 
create deeper and deeper freezes. The problem is that our first frost and freezes of the fall tend to come out of nowhere. So they tend to do a lot more damage than colder freezes that come in late fall or early winter. So no matter what happens, I strongly recommend that you get yourself a little frost cover, be it something like agricultural fabric or a frost blanket. Simply keeping the frost off of the leaves does a whole lot to protect them from damage. So even if it gets pretty cold and it freezes hard underneath the frost blankets, simply the act of keeping the frost off of the vegetation, I found, does a lot to keep the plants in better shape. So if you're going to get an early frost in the fall before your crop matures, or you're going to get a series of hard frosts in the spring before your plants are ready, just cover them up. It will do a lot of good to protect them. Now let's discuss insects that affect your brassicas. Here where I live in North Carolina, I have found by far that the most detrimental pests to my brassicas are worms and caterpillars. They are usually the offspring of moths. The moths will come in the middle of the night, they will lay their eggs on the brassicas, they will hatch, and in a short period of time, worms and caterpillars can devastate your brassica crop. Now that may vary based on the location that you're in. Here in North Carolina, I find that I have low pest pressure in late winter, early spring, when we're still getting frost and freezes. And also I have low pest pressure in late fall, early winter, when we start getting more frost and freezes. But in that March, April, May time period, and in this September, October time period, I can have issues with insects. Now I have found that the most useful insecticide for brassicas is spinosad. Now spinosad is a natural bacteria that you spray on the leaves of the plants and then the worms and caterpillars and other pests that eat the leaves, they ingest the bacteria and that harms their digestive system and usually kills them in a matter of a few days. Now the reason why I like this insecticide so much is it is generally safe to use around beneficial insects. Most beneficial insects are carnivorous so they don't eat the leaves of the plants. So for that reason, it's usually not harmful to beneficial officials. Also other things like honeybees and bumblebees, they go after flowers. Brassicas don't flower unless you let them go to seed. So it's totally safe to spray your brassicas as long as they aren't flowering. If they are flowering, just make sure that you don't spray the flowers during the spring or, or the early fall if they're bolting and going to seed on you. And of course, if you're interested in where to buy either this spinosad insecticide or if you need frost blankets and agricultural fabric, I will place direct links down in the video description to all of them. And that right there is pretty much everything you need to know to get you started growing brassicas. Now, if you've never grown brassicas before, I recommend that you just go out there and do it because everything else you need to learn, you will only learn through experience, through doing. So get your hands dirty, get some seeds, put them in the ground as soon as you can. And I'm telling you, they're just so much fun to grow and it's so much nicer to garden in this cooler fall weather. So everybody, I sure hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel and please ring that notification bell so you're notified when I release more videos like these. If you have any questions about the concepts discussed in this video, please ask them down in the comments below and I will do my best to address them. If you're curious about any of the products that I featured in this video or that I use in real life in my garden to grow more food, I have them all linked down below in the video description in my Amazon storefront. And while you're there, check out my spread shop for custom merch if you want to support the channel. Thank you all so much for watching and I hope to see all of you again on the next video. Somebody's on the hunt. What are you sniffing over there, buddy? You better not get yourself into trouble. One of these days that nose is gonna uncover something that it shouldn't find. I have to constantly snoopervise you. Look at that thing go. Dale, Dale, stop hounding. Stop hounding. Buddy, you're gonna find something that you shouldn't find. Are you ready for breakfast? This is how into his sense Dale gets. He doesn't even react to food. Are you hungry? Come on, Dale, let's go get our hungries. Come on, let's get our hungries. It's breakfast time. Oh no, he's just into another scent.